Hello and welcome to this session in our Wandsworth Climate Summit. My name is Andrew Hager. I'm the Policy and Review Manager here at Wandsworth Council uh, and I will be hosting this session on green space. The summit started earlier this week and we've already covered how to develop a sustainability strategy, uh, young people's involvement in climate change, waste and recycling and greening your home. Earlier this morning, we held a session on transport and then one on the circular economy. So if you if you have attended one or both, then thank you for your interest and also your perseverance. Uh, in this session, voluntary organisations will give us tips on what we can do in our gardens to support biodiversity and how to enjoy our green spaces. And afterwards, we will be hosting a very quick online quiz. Um, we're not having a Q&A uh, section in this session, but if you do have any questions, questions or comments, please do make them and we will try to respond where we can during the event. So uh, the running order for today, we've got Councillor Sutters, who's the Cabinet Member for Community Services and Open Spaces, who will give an introduction on green spaces in our borough. And then we have Colin Cooper, who's the Chief Executive of Habitats and Heritage, who's going to outline biodiversity and its importance and the well-being benefits of focusing on this topic. Then we have Emma Broadbent, a uh, London Rivers Officer from South East Rivers Trust, um, who will be focusing on the benefit of blue spaces and the role of rivers in helping us to tackle climate change. Then we're going to have Ian Mitchell, who's the Managing Director from Enable, who will talk about trees, walks and talks and what we can do to help in our green spaces. Uh, then we are going to premiere a new video from the Friends of Wandsworth Common Group. And then we'll be joined by David Lindo, the Urban Birder, who will explain why he is passionate about birding and nature and give tips on what we can do in our own gardens and outdoor spaces. And then we're going to have the quiz. Now, uh, uh, the live quiz is going to be um, held at the end um, and you'll see a link uh, to the quiz in the announcement section, which is going to be um, how, uh, take place on a, a website called Slido. So if you follow the link, it'll take you to the quiz. The event code is WSC 2020. So go to the Slido website, enter into the quiz and the quiz questions will appear um, when the, the quiz starts. Um, if that's not working for you, don't worry, you can still play along at home using good old fashioned pen and paper. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, we'll start the session. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Councillor Steffi Sutters, who's the Cabinet Member for Community Services and Open Spaces. Okay, so I think you need to take yourself off mute. Is that better? Yes, that's working. I'm now. so Thank you. sorry. So as I was saying, uh, yes, I am Steffi Sutters. I'm the Cabinet Member for Community Services and Open Spaces. Andrew has just run through the excellent group of speakers we have with us today. And I've got to say, I'm really looking forward to everything that they're going to share with us. The interesting thing about this session is it's not a straight line. There are so many elements that we need to talk about. We're not going to be able to get through them all this morning, but we can at least get a flavour of what's being done. Next slide, please. Next slide. So our vision, we declared a climate emergency in July 2019 and our vision was to make ones with the greenest in the London borough by committing ourselves to a series of steps that would get us there. Some are listed above and many are still in train because this is an evolving programme. And I cannot possibly do justice to all the hard work of our contractors, friends groups and volunteers in the short time I have today who are working towards this ambitious goal. Wandsworth is blessed with over 40% open space. But when we talk about open spaces here, we're not just talking about those large green spaces. I also want to bring in all the urban space, all the small spaces that we encourage to be formed through the planning system and all those that already exist. Many of you will know that the provision of amenity space has taken on new meaning during the pandemic and it's been absolutely wonderful to see the way that people have been enjoying our open spaces. And whilst I'm very proud that we are forming new park in Springfield in Tooting and the Linear Park in Nine Elms, I'm always aware that our job will never be done. We must keep making these spaces better and we must keep finding more places in which people can relax and enjoy nature. And climate change is, of course, sorry, next slide. 
Climate change is, of course, a major threat to the natural world. And so, of course, as you would expect, we have developed an action plan that will be our route map to protection. Some of the elements, again, as shown above, still still in development, but all long term will help us move towards our goal. Next slide, please. And the slide says it, how will we achieve it? I said earlier, we cannot do this alone. We have to get everybody involved. We have lots of projects taking place all the time that aim to do just that. And I want to give a couple of examples. The first, which is not shown on the slide, is the hedge for Boutflower Road. Now, that's a strange thing, you might think. Why is she mentioning that? But I was invited to a hedge planting event yesterday. In this instance, we have a playground on a busy main road but we know that hedges reduce pollution and particulate levels by up to half. And the playground was very exposed. So I was very keen that we should do something here with a hedge to offer that protection. It's a very small step, but it is an important step for the users, particularly young children of that space. But I suspect its significance will be lost on many. And at the other end of the scale, as shown on this slide, I want to showcase the Tooting Common Heritage Project which enable, Ian Mitch have enabled, joined us in. This was part funded by the grant from the National Lottery and did so much to improve the environmental quality of Tooting Common and bring the community together. It had truly wonderful outcomes. I would now like to show you a clip from a longer film celebrating exactly what it achieved. With the help of Wandsworth Borough Council and a £1.4 million grant from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, we all came together to improve the common. Volunteers have been absolutely critical to the success of this project. They have contributed an amazing amount of time and energy. The fossil tree, the fountain, the Woodford Pavilion, the Lido, all of those things have contributed to the community and that's a really wonderful thing to have been part of and to think of that future generations will have that in their lives. The wildlife, the history, the cafe, people from all sorts of different networks and different communities have come together as a result of the project. I think the improvements have made people value the common more. I think people come here from further afield. I think they appreciate and understand the common and why it's here, how it's been loved in the past, and how it's going to be loved in the future. I feel a bit more optimistic going forward because when you're on your own, as it were, you just kind of going out in the morning and you might meet the odd person who asks you what you're doing or have you seen any interesting birds. But if you've got a group of people and you've got a society, well then you can start to make things happen. It's just great to see so many improvements going on on the common and especially for us at the Lido because this is our special place. We transformed to in common for the generations to come. And most importantly, we've done it together. 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 We did it Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I mean, isn't that a really moving film? It says far more than the words that I can ever say to you to explain exactly what's going on in Wandsworth and the effect it's having on people's lives and on the natural environment. And it will come as no surprise, having watched that, to know that Tooting Common was awarded a green flag. A green flag is an international mark of quality for well-managed parks and green spaces all over the world. But we didn't just get one extra one this year, we've now got three extra ones, bringing our total to four. 
far more work in that too than you can possibly imagine. But I am extremely proud of the teams that have delivered that. Next slide, please. And just before I close down, because uh, I know we've got lots of speakers to get through, I just wanted to highlight another couple of things. Trees are an integral part of everything we do at the moment. We're currently maintaining approximately 60,000 trees across the borough. That's a huge amount of work, and I think the teams that do it, do it extremely well. We want to increase the number of trees we have because we know what a part they pay in uh, climate change, in recognition of the shade, the sequestering of carbon and the evapotranspiration. That's a very difficult word to say, but I've just managed it, that help cool temperatures where trees are blowing. Now we have actually isolated some places within Wandsworth where we do not have trees or enough trees such as Garrett Lane, and you will see them being added there over time. But £100,000 will be spent over the next two years. Next slide, please. And finally, we always have to be aware that we must make whatever programmes we're doing accessible. So we have a highly visible communications plan, which is another important strand of our work to aim to take residents with us on our journey or whatever part of that journey they wish to travel with us for. Here you will see a campaign we ran in the summer for Love to Garden, and it did get quite a lot of traction. We could also talk about the plogging events that go on in the parks which highlight the damaging effect of litter and our work with schools and our plans for their escaping at the town hall, which will be strikingly different after so many years of seeing colourful bedding plants. But I'll just by end by saying that every time you pull up a bedding plant, you release carbon. So let's think about our planting schemes too. Thank you very much for listening to me and I'll now hand back to Andrew. Thank you very much, Councillor Sutters. Uh, I think that's some great examples of what we're doing. Uh, also, I, I really like um, the hedge as an example of a small piece of greenery that can have a, a really big impact. And that Susan Common video was uh, very, very inspiring. So uh, next up, we have Colin Cooper, who's Chief Executive of Habitats and Heritage. So I will hand over to Colin now. Thank you very much, Councillor Sutters and Andrew. Hello, yes, I'm Colin Cooper. I'm Chief Executive of Habitats and Heritage. I also chair the Richmond Biodiversity Partnership and I'm a trustee at the charity Parks for London. In case you've not heard of Habitats and Heritage, we're a new charity, a result of a merge between the Environment Trust and South West London Environment Network, and it's combining the resources and the competencies of each charity. So, what is can you see that slide change? What is biodiversity? Uh, bear me one moment. So what is biodiversity? Sorry about that. Um, so this is a term that has uh, been coined by the UN Convention on Biodiversity uh, in 1992. The variability among living organisms from all sources, terrestrial, marine and other aquatic ecosystems and ecological complexes of which they are part. This includes diversity within species, between species and of ecosystems. So why is biodiversity important? Now I've drawn up there's five strands to this, which I'm going to explore in a little detail um, and other following presenters will go into much more detail. So biodiversity is integral to the entirety of the ecosystem. Biodiversity is an essential part of the solution to climate change. Biodiversity is good for the economy. Biodiversity is an in integral part of culture and ident our identity and biodiversity helps humans stay healthy. And of course, we've come to realise that much more over this year. So going into the bit of detail of being integral to the ecosystem. To give you an analogy, an airplane wing has a certain amount of redundancy built into its design, as does much of nature. 
you can take out some of the rivets of the wing and it will still hold together and the plane will still fly. But remove some and you remove too many rivets and the plane will crash. The same is biodiversity. Wandsworth Borough is fortunate to have a number of biodiversity rich corridors, the Thames, the Wandle, Barn Elms, Beverly Brook, to name but a few. And some of the other speakers will detail this after my presentation. Biodiversity is an essential part to the climate change solution. Hang on. Um, there we go. In a landmark study published in 2017, a group of researchers led by Bronson Grimson, who researches natural climate solutions at Conservation International, discovered that nature can deliver at least 30% of the emissions reductions needed by 2030 to prevent climate catastrophe. Protecting biodiversity plays a crucial part in achieving these emissions reductions. The importance of soil and planting machines in sequestering carbon is increasingly being realised and it's thought that soil organic carbon harbours three times more sequestration than in uh, the Earth's atmosphere. Plants and trees taking carbon from the atmosphere through photosynthesis, and this is then locked into the soil through the plants and trees roots. This carbon can be released through harvesting, tilling or ploughing and erosion. You'll hear from Ian Mitchell from Enable about their pioneering work in this area shortly. We also know that reforestation, rewilding and planting can play an important part in reducing water runoff and flood management. And Ember Broadbent from South East Rivers Trust will provide more detail about this. So biodiversity is good for the economy. At least 40% of the world's economy and 80% of the needs of the poor are derived from biological resources. Altogether, the food, commercial forestry and ecotourism industries could lose $338 billion per year if the loss of biodiversity continues its current pace. Around 75% of global food production of global food crops rely on animals and insects such as bees to pollinate them, but many of these pollinators populations are in decline, which could put more than $235 billion of agricultural products at risk. Meanwhile, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity Initiative estimates that global sustainable business opportunities for investing in natural resources could be worth between two and six trillion dollars by 2050. Putting some context to this around London and Wandsworth and using a study by the Vivid Economics commissioned by the Mayor of London, the Heritage Lottery Fund and the National Trust determines that the monetary value of public green spaces in relation to the people's physical and mental health, recreation and amenity. For every one pound spent on public green spaces, it creates the 27 pounds in value for the public, providing expenditure in green spaces provides exceptional value for money for Londoners. Biodiversity is an integral part of culture and identity. Species are frequently integrated into religious, cultural and national identities. All major religions include an element of nature and 231 species are formally used as national symbols in 142 countries. Unfortunately, more than one third of those species are threatened but the bald eagle and the American bison are examples of conservation success because of their role as national symbols. Ecosystems such as parks and other protected areas also provide recreation and knowledge of resources for vi visitors and biodiversity is a frequent source of inspiration for artists and designers. You might not know, but the Wandsworth coat of arms adopted in 1965 features a dove with a sprig of lavender in its mouth to represent Lavender Hill. So biodiversity helps humans stay healthy and there's two strands to this, uh, both of which we've, we've come to realise this year. Biodiversity ecosystems intact help humans stay healthy and good human health and well-being is definitely connected to biodiversity. Research indicates there is a close link between disease outbreaks and deg degradation of nature. 70% of emerging viral diseases have spread from animals to humans. 
as the global wildlife trade continues and development of projects expanded deeper into tropical rainforest, humans are increasingly exposed to wild animals and the diseases that they may carry. We also know from our own uh, uh, experiences in the first lockdown that nature is good for our well-being and combating social isolation. There's also a wealth of evidence to back up this study. In 1996, the study Environmental Psychology, uh, also in Richard Louv's book published in 20, uh, 2005, The Last Child in the Woods, which coined the term nature deficit disorder, and a study in 20, 2019 by multiple authors concluded expending at least 120 minutes a week in nature is associated with good health and well-being. Green spaces are vital to our mental health and can mitigate some of the difficult social isolation. Um, and this has been evidenced by research by Professor Maya Lindenberg of the Central Institute of Mental Health in Germany. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, he published two studies revealing how access to green spaces improves well-being for people who live in urban communities. City dwellers, despite their living in close proximity to low social groups, often show higher risk of mental health illness and the burden is especially heavy on people living in poverty. I'd like to give some statistics of the loss of biodiversity in the UK, which are quite startling. These are taken from some of them from a book called Wilding, um, associated with an urban uh, wilding project in Sussex, the, the Nepa state. So since 1966, we've lost 40 million birds in the UK. Between 1970 and 1990, we've lost 20 million, pound, 20 million pairs of farmland birds. Between 2002 and 2013, one half our protected species have declined. In 2016, the government's assessment of the population of 152 priority species are still declining. And we're in imminent danger of losing 10% of 15% of our species overall. The number of Britain's most endangered species is more than halved since 1970, with one in 10 species overall threatened with extinction. Moths have declined 88%, beetles have declined 72%, and butterflies 76%. Worryingly, using the Biodiversity Intactness Index, the UK has lost significantly more biodiversity over the long term than the world's average, ranking as 189th out of 218 countries. I think you'll agree that's quite startling, but you'll also be pleased to see that a lot of activity is happening in the UK and in Wandsworth to tackle that. So that's my, my presentation over. Um, here's how you can contact me if you have any questions resulting from my presentation or you want to understand a bit more about our work. And thank you for the opportunity to speak, uh, Councillor Sutters and Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, that's great uh, to, to hear about um, the importance of biodiversity. Some very stark figures there on biodiversity loss, but also showing how nature is a big part in preventing climate change, as well as the importance um, of stopping climate change in order to protect biodiversity. So next up, we have Emma Broadbent, who's uh, from the South East Rivers Trust, and is going to talk to us about the role of rivers and blue spaces. So Emma, over to you. Sorry, I muted. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Emma and uh, I work as London Rivers Officer for the South East Rivers Trust. And we are a grassroots environmental charity dedicated to the restoration and protection of rivers in the South East of England. Um, we're part of the National Rivers Trust movement with many members working across the UK and Ireland to restore and protect river and wetland habitats. Um, so some of you may have heard of us as the Wandle Trust, which is how we started. Um, and since then, we've expanded our area of work and have become the South East Rivers Trust, um, taking on new river catchments across the South East. And we now cover 12 river catchments from Basingstoke to Dover. So what do we do? Um, there's four key pillars to our work. The first of those is engagement. So um, that's things like volunteering events, talks and walks. Um, and they all have the aim of empowering local communities to become involved in their local river. We also have um, an education, education arm. So we run a project called Project Kingfisher, which delivers school sessions 
for primary age children. Um, and more recently, we've been producing online resources, which have been particularly important for people during lockdown. We also deliver ecological improvement. So our delivery team is out on the ground um, delivering practical river restoration to restore natural processes to rivers, making them better habitat, habitats for wildlife and much nice places for people to enjoy as well. Uh, and finally, we, we work in partnership. So um, we work with stakeholders like local councils, water companies and the Environment Agency um, to look at the issues that face rivers and how we might work together to make improvements. So this map shows the two rivers in Wandsworth and their catchments. Um, so the black, the black area on the map is the catchment um, and that's the area of the land that drains into the river. So you can see from the map that um, the catchment, the area that drains into that river is actually much larger than just the immediate area around the river. So for the Wandle, it's 200 square kilometres um, and slightly smaller for the Beverly Brook of 64 square kilometres. Um, so in the 1960s, the Wandle was actually declared biologically dead, um, but it's made a remarkable recovery since then with help of local people and local organisations. The red area at the top shows you Wandsworth. So you can see that um, the Wandle is running right through the centre and then out to the west, you've got little parts of the Beverly Brook that fall within Wandsworth Borough. So both of these rivers are tributaries of the Thames and they're both characterised as urban rivers. So this presents unique challenges and threats as they're in close proximity to areas with high population density. So the Wandle is particularly special as it's a chalk stream and there are only 200 of these in the world um, and 90 percent of them are found in southeast of England. Um, um, chalk streams are, as their name suggests, streams that throw through chalk. Um, they're typically wide and shallow um, and due to the filtering effect of the chalk, they um, often have exceptionally clear waters. Uh, and in a natural chalk stream, the water is often um, very stable temperature and flow level. There are several species associated with chalk streams um, and linked to the habitat it provides. So you might find fish like brown trout, salmon, bullhead, eels, plants like water crowfoot, um, invertebrates like mayflies, and other animals like water voles, otters, kingfishers, white clawed crayfish. So they're really special habitats. Um, and rivers and the green spaces that border them are really important habitats and corridors for wildlife. And this can be especially important in urban settings like Wandsworth, uh, as they allow wildlife to move through the urban landscape. So the Wandle and the Beverly Brook are home to species such as kingfisher and the critically endangered European eel. And along the Wandle, you might also spot a brown trout, which are associated with really good um, quality chalk stream water. Uh, and as we all know, um, and as Colin has touched on, blue and green spaces have been um, particularly important during lockdown and numerous studies have shown uh, that contact with blue spaces as well as green spaces enhances well-being and mental health. So if you want to get out um, and enjoy these blue and green spaces, I can highly recommend the Wandle Trail and the Beverly Brook Walk. Um, they both take in some really beautiful sections of river and surrounding green space. The Wandle Trail runs for 12 and a half miles and takes in over 10 parks, wetlands and a nature reserve. Um, and the Beverly Brook Walk runs for six and a half miles, taking in Wimbledon Common, Richmond Park and Barnes Common. So I wanted to touch a little bit on climate change. Um, as it's going to have an impact for our rivers in coming years. Um, the Environment Agency has warned that within 25 years, England will not have enough water to meet demand, mostly as a result of climate change. Um, in the UK, we use more water per person than most other European countries, and we are particularly bad in the South East, using more water per person than other parts of the UK, around 150 litres per person per day. Um, and a large proportion of the water in the southeast is extract, abstracted from underground reserves of water or aquifers that feed our chalk streams. Um, and the southeast is the most densely populated region of the UK. So this means that the demand for water here is even higher um, and it's only project, projected to increase as our population grows. So with climate change altering weather patterns, the implications of this could be long periods of drought and shorter but more intense heavy rainfall events. 
And extreme weather events won't just impact our availability of water in times of drought, they will also impact flood risk. Um, and this is exacerbated by hard surfaces like paving and tarmac, as these prevent water from draining um, through the ground um, and back into the groundwater aquifer, and instead the water runs off the land and into our rivers. But it's not all doom and gloom. Um, as an organisation, we're trying to mitigate for these impacts in various ways. So um, we carry out river restoration work, which might include things like low flow channels, which means that the riverbed stays wet when we experience low flows. Um, and we might also put in backwaters or refuge areas. Um, that means when pollution events occur and the water level is low, which can make the impact of that worse, there are places for fish and other wildlife to seek refuge. So these pictures on this slide show a uh, site along the Wando in Hatbridge, where you can see the before and after pictures of a river restoration project. Um, and on the right side of that bottom picture, you can see um, a backwater area that's been put in, which will provide refuge from that main channel um, if a pollution event was to occur. So sustainable drainage systems um, are features like rain gardens, wetlands or permeable permeable paving um, that slow the flow of water into rivers by retaining it in the landscape, allowing it to drain back into the land. Um, and natural flood management is something similar, um, but typically a more natural structure that slows the flow of water, um, like leaky woody dams. Um, and in more, in more rural areas, we're also looking to work with landowners at things like soil management, um, changing land management practices, so that rainwater can permeate, permeate more easily through soil um, and this can have the added benefit of reducing the amount of soil that's washed off the of fields and into our rivers. There are also lots of things that you can do um, to help. So as I mentioned earlier, our water consumption in the southeast is particularly high, so anything you can do at home to reduce your water use is really worthwhile. Um, and this can include things like taking shorter showers, turning off the shower while you lather up, turning off the tap when you brush your teeth, fixing leaking taps, only putting on full loads of washing. Um, and there's also some really great water saving devices that you can fit to your toilet or shower. Um, and lots of water companies give these out for free and you can order them online. Um, installing water butts in your garden is also a really great idea. And you can then use that water to water your plants instead of using the treated water that comes from your tap or hose pipe. Um, the other thing we would encourage people to do is reduce paved areas in your garden or your driveway. Um, so this will reduce the amount of water that runs into surface water drains when it rains. Um, and it helps by allowing the water to drain slowly through the land instead of going straight into the river, which can cause really quick rises in river level, which can have an impact on flood risk. Um, and there are some really great permeable paving solutions out there, which allow you to still have a hard surface, but allow water to drain through. Um, so as an individual, these might feel like really small interventions, but collectively they can make a really big difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, that's fantastic. Um, and, and congratulations on the work with, with the ones I think bringing back from being biologically dead is, is in the Fast, fantastic achievement, and um, also the information about chalk streams. I had no idea they were so unique to the to the southeast in terms of actual global um, uniqueness. Um, so that's fantastic, and um, the, the the stuff you talked about with about the the threat about droughts and 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 the impact there. So sort of when people talk about the impact of droughts on on um, sort of coming through from climate change, that that's what we mean. It, it's about water use and then where we pull the water from. So it is really fantastic to have uh, information about that. Um, so next up, we have Ian Mitchell, who is the Managing Director of Enable. And Ian is going to talk about trees, walks and talks and what we can do to help in our green spaces. So Ian, uh, over to you. Uh, just getting the slides up, sorry, there's a slight delay on that. Um, so I think it's going to go over to Ian now. 
Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you, Councillor Sutters, um, for inviting me in to talk about green spaces in Wandsworth. Um, I'm Ian Mitchell for the uh, Managing Director, um, Enable Leisure and Culture, and um, just wanted to talk through in just one second. Just making sure my slides are up. Thank you. Um, Enable, Enable Leisure are a charitable organisation uh, that work in Wandsworth, based in Wandsworth, and we provide uh, all the management services for Wandsworth Borough Council um, to uh, across all the green spaces and trees. Um, one of the one of the biggest things in in uh, green space management is is about education uh, and making sure that all the information is out there, readily available to all users um, or, or of of the green spaces. Uh, inside and outside all the commons and, and parks and gardens uh, that uh, ones would have. In terms of educating in terms of climate change, um, what, what we've been doing is working with all our stakeholders uh, across the area. Uh, there's not uh, just users, there's a, a lot of people coming in and planting in terms of contractors uh, and other, other users that will come in and, and plant across the green spaces uh, through Enable and Wandsworth Council. And it's about advising what is suitable in these areas. We've heard a, a, um, a lot of great stuff from Colin. Remember today about it's so important to plant the right things in green spaces um, to, to add into biodiversity and support uh, the climate change uh, we're going through. In addition to that, um, sharing the knowledge uh, also for our users uh, and educating and providing education for all of our users uh, that come into uh, green spaces um, and hopefully take some of, some, some of that information home as well. So we deliver um, with, with our friends of groups and deliver uh, swiftly from our horticulture and arboriculture and biodiversity team walks and talks uh, all around uh, Wandsworth into the green spaces. Um, and these, these talks provide information of physical look of the green space and what's going on in the green space um, and help educate um, all users to, to understand what they can do uh, within the green space as well and enjoy it. Some of the, some of the information we provide and, and here um, you can see the picture is of a Tutankhamen information board. There's a, quite a few of these currently around Wandsworth in the green space and more going up in, in 2021. Um, these, these information boards provides a little bit of information about what's happening in that green space, uh, the type of habitats in there and, and the wildlife that actually lives within the habitats. Um, this, is, this is a way of ed educating, providing useful information and, and, and a part of enjoyment of the green space and supporting that when you visit that around uh, Wandsworth Borough. In addition, we provide some infographics that, that are sent to homes, are readily available online, of what you can do in in your own green space or communal garden or or when you're um, anywhere in Wandsworth. This is about trees and shrub planting to make sure that it's all sustainable, suitable for habitats uh, and increasing uh, biodiversity in and outside of public green spaces. Another education is, is the contractors that we work with um, that support green spaces across the borough. Um, some of the grasslands uh, will be changing and are changing uh, through 2021 into 22 and, and further afield, supporting the uh, Wandsworth environmental and sustainability strategy is seeing where grassland was previously cut uh, regularly, uh, is leaving some of that grass to, to grow slightly longer, to improve the habitat and to increase the wildlife and biodiversity of those areas. So those will be changing going across the parks and open spaces on public land. Trees are ever important. I've seen a lot of comments uh, in the chats today about, about trees and they are very important as we all know to the climate change that we're going through. The trees, there's approximately 60,000 uh, trees on public land. Um, there's even more trees on, on private land. Um, looking after the trees is, is vitally important and supporting uh, new tree growth and development um, and volunteer watering programs uh, that we're working with, with, with some areas uh, within Wandsworth as well. So vital employment of importance. Colin um, talked about, and I think Councillor Sutter's talked about um, soil management. Now, so, soil management from, from our point of view in a, in a public land 
is is how we store the carbon and, and keep the carbon that is within the soil um, stored um, and safe. Now, a lot of our uh, public spaces in, in Wandsworth and Wandsworth Council's public spaces are um, old Victorian gardens with uh, bedding plants that have been changed over every three times a year. Um, and every time that a bedding plant comes out, the soil is disturbed and the carbon that is being kept within that from the plants, as Colin mentioned, um, is put out back in the atmosphere. So what we're doing with our contractors is, is working through some programmes of, of uh, carbon storage where we don't uh, turf um, and, and take the carbon out of the soil and, and put sustainable planting in there to make sure the carbon is uh, kept within the soil in, in some areas. Next slide. So what are, what are we doing? What does Enable do in working with Wandsworth Council on, on green actions? We'll be looking into green corridors and Emma mentioned about some blue corridors and how, how water has a, an effect for uh, habitats uh, walking through and uh, swimming through green, blue corridors. But in green corridors, this is about how habitats and wildlife travel across um, the borough. And from what we're creating and what we're working with the council on is creating green corridors across the borough. So wildlife can travel, can travel safely, can forage for few food during these green corridors and, and promote more biodiversity within these green corridors. Sustainable planting is, as I've mentioned in my previous slide, very important, making sure that the right types of plants have been put in, plants that don't need to be dug up every year and relayed plants that can be sustainable for the future and can encourage biodiversity across things. So the some parks and green spaces around Wandsworth will be slightly changing and linking into our information there'll be now from our trees and our biodiversity walks, we'll be doing sustainable planting walks where we can show around people what, what we're doing and how we're doing it in the open spaces in Wandsworth. Recycling is, is always a high priority and, and coming uh, in the next few months and into 21, recycling in our green spaces uh, will be put in place. And it's not just product recycling, so the, the traditional bottles um, uh, in, in our, on our bins. This will be green recycling as well, which we've been doing for a, a number of years now. This is using the green materials out of the parks and then re-putting them into the parks uh, in mulch. So therefore we're re redoing and putting green recycling back into the area. It's very important and very important part and, and it features quite heavily in the environmental strategy um, that we push forward re recycling. Biodiversity um, with the strategy being launched next year uh, in Wandsworth, um, heavily important to enhance that, support that and do and follow the action plan in the biodiversity, Wandsworth biodiversity strategy to make sure that we are fully embracing that and encouraging and enhancing biodiversity in the borough. So what, what can uh, Wandsworth Borough residents do um, to help? What's your role in helping in the green space and improving and doing this together? Uh, we, all, we all went through a very interesting summer where a lot of people hit the green spaces and, and litter is probably in every green space in, uh, across, across the UK and especially uh, in London. Now lit taking litter home is, is vital and important, but also recycling. Uh, and making sure that we, re we recycle, green, re green recycle at home as well uh, in terms of uh, going forward. Going home and looking, home, looking at information about sustainable planting, we'll be launching some planting guides into 2021, which will help and assist where you can sustainably plant at home. Have a, a look at when your garden and, and see how you can green up your garden. And I think there was a, a previous seminar, a seminar on this earlier this, this week where it's every space in your garden can be greened. And if you have a garden, if you don't have a garden, then communal spaces or even a, a plot of grass outside of your flats without gardens. Encouraging our wildlife um, linked to biodiversity and recording the wildlife, anything you see from your window, within a garden, in a green space. And there's ways on the council's website to and enables website to how you can record the more we have recording, the more we can encourage that, the more we can learn from the wildlife that is happening around the borough. Greening up your garden design is looking at your garden in a different way. 
seeing where you've got a front garden and rather than rather than paving and putting a, a driveway in is is seeing what else can be done uh, to keep that and encourage uh, green. I think Emma mentioned about uh, uh, that for water bases, but also for uh, the green corridor bases that I talked about, talked about earlier and seeing how you can green up your garden and let, let your garden go a little bit in some areas to encourage wildlife and biodiversity. Next slide. Getting involved and working together. This is one of the most important things and how we can do this together. There are many stakeholder groups and they use our open spaces and green spaces across Wandsworth. Um, that's not necessarily a, a formed group and structured group. This, this the groups can be a couple of uh, people having a walk on a regular basis, uh, a nursery using the groups, schools using the groups. Lots of people use uh, our green spaces in, and more so in, in this time, and which is amazing to see. Engage with, the, engage with these groups, socialise with these groups. Vitally important that we get out and see who's using and, and work with our stakeholder groups. We have a number of uh, amazing friends of groups around Wandsworth. Uh, a list of these are on uh, uh, the Council's and Enables uh, website where you can get involved with a more structured environment uh, with friends who do a fantastic job across all of our commons, parks and gardens. Uh, and uh, you can ideally get involved. If you do not have a friends group near you and you have a green space, then consider developing a friends group. And we're more than happy to help out in the formation of that and, and what's needed. Getting involved with your community in green space and how you can get involved. And, and this is where we can bring together everyone to enjoy the green space and get some involvement. Get involved in consultation that happens across the borough with green spaces and how that consultation can lead to improvements within your own green space. It's been said today by Colin and, and by him the benefits of green space and it doesn't need to be understated that uh, the physical, mental and social benefits, especially during this time, but in any normal time, has a massive benefit of green space and promoting that benefits within your own circles, with your own frameworks on social media and benefits of getting together and really enjoying our green space. So what's, what's, uh, what happens around Wandsworth? So in Wandsworth, we have a, a number of animals being uh, and habitats that, that are formed. So in around um, uh, the Putney area in, in Putney Common, um, in, uh, in our uh, Pleasance there, Putney Park Lane, we have a number of sightings of hedgehogs around, around this area. Um, we have bats, all bat sightings across the, the whole of Wandsworth. Wandsworth Park, particularly feeding ground, Tooting Common uh, as well as a feeding ground for bats. Go out in the twilight, have a look up and see what you can see. Again, record, enjoy uh, the things. Stag beetles um, and uh, stag beetles across Wandsworth. They are usually within the dead wood areas or, or lying in, in, the, in the ground where woods. We've created with uh, the friends of some areas, uh, dead log piles or dead hedges where to encourage stag beetles. So if you do see anything around and piles of logs, do not disturb them, but have a look and enjoy, enjoy the nature and what's being created out there. We'll also um, have a, a, a lot, uh, as, as um, Emma said, the brown trout sightings around King George's Park, um, around the Wandle in King George's Park have been sighted. So there's lots to do around, around Wandsworth, uh, a lot of green over spaces on the Wandsworth Council site, and on Enable site, there's um, uh, a list of every green space uh, in Wandsworth and, and also what can be found in that green space for you to, to explore and engage and enjoy that green space. So it is about doing this together, it is about getting together and making a difference together. And thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you in one of the green spaces in Wandsworth.
Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, I, I think it's great uh, that you highlighted the importance of carbon storage for soil and sustainable planting uh, and also the reuse of materials. That links very nicely to um, the circular economy session that we had this morning about the reuse of, of materials. And that's also some great tips for residents on how to improve and protect and enjoy um, green spaces as well. So next up, we've got a video from Friends of Wandsworth Common. This is a premiere uh, of, a, of a video from that group. And um, yeah, we're going to play that now for you. Welcome to Wandsworth Common. I'm Richard Fox. I'm co-chair of the Friends of Wandsworth Common. This is my wife, Julia, who's the other co-chair. And we're very pleased to be joined this afternoon by Annabel Osborne, the Parks Biodiversity Officer for Enable Leisure and Culture, who covers the whole of um, Wandsworth Green Spaces. We are situated here in front of this black poplar, which blew over in one of the storms at the end of last year. And the reason we're here is because it's a very good example of one of the downsides of climate change. So this tree and its neighbour over there were standing in a, a lake basically for several months at the end of last year due to the amount of rain we had. And that had the effect of weakening its roots and um, increasing the rot that, that had started to take place in its roots. And so the first storm that came along, unfortunately, the tree fell over. And this is what we now see today. Another fine example of where climate change has caused problems with excess water is actually an area over to my right here, which is one of the big lakes that we have on Wandsworth Common. And the problem is the water level changes the whole time through the seasons. So in the winter, we get flooding and in the summer the water levels are too low and money has to be spent pumping water in artificially. We're going to hand over to Annabelle now to talk about how Enable are trying to help us and sort out some of these problems and build us a more resilient future. We aim to make our habitats more resilient to climate change so the principles that we follow to do that are to make them firstly bigger, make all the habitats as large as we can with the space that we're given, improve their quality so that doesn't just mean planting individual trees it means thinking about the understory layer a shrub layer and then the tree layer and something that we're doing in conjunction with the friends of ones with common is to create some mini forests so not only are we planting trees as part of that but we're also looking to plant an understory layer where we've got small herbs we've got grasses growing up we've also then got shrubs and taller plants and then we have the tree layer and the final principle is trying to make those habitats more joined up so we are doing that in various ways across the common um, it's guided in main by the management and maintenance plan um, and improving and maintaining a diverse mosaic of different habitats really is the key to making the common and all of our open spaces more resilient to climate change. This year we've trialled some new long grass areas where the grass only gets cut once a year um, and the purpose of that is to follow that principle of connecting habitats. So we've trialled two of those. Um, something Enable did a few years ago to try and combat the issues at the lake with flooding and with the drought is creating an amphibian pond. So we dug out a large area to the north of the pond, which in winter absorbs some of the overfill water. Um, and then throughout the season, as it gets warmer, it then slowly dries out. Um, and that's known as an ephemeral pond. And it's fantastic habitat for amphibians. We've come to the edge of the common and you may be able to hear the road in the background. But Annabelle, tell us what Enable are doing to help screen us from the pollution that comes from the roads. So up in the north of the common, we've got a small area with a playground. And around that edge of that playground, we've got, it's totally encompassed by roads. So we're going to be planting some native hedging. And the purpose of that it's not only going to screen that area from pollution particles from the vehicles, but again, it will act as another form of habitat connectivity. 
I probably don't need to explain to anyone in the audience listening today the absolute vital importance of green spaces. But let's just recap why we need them. So we need them for our own physical and mental health. But we need them for the health of every species that lives here and for the health of our entire planet. So all green spaces, uh, and in particular the effect of trees, do a massive amount to mitigate the problems that we're facing currently. Green spaces absorb water, so they are flood mitigation. Green spaces are climate coolers and warmers. Green spaces are cooler than urban areas in the summer and they're warmer in the winter. Trees actually soften wind velocity and wind has a lower effect in trees than it does outside. And that is the complete reversal of high buildings which actually increase wind velocity because the wind has to travel up and over the building and it accelerates. And the other absolutely vital function of our green spaces and our trees in particular is the sequestration of carbon dioxide. So the storing of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which is life saving for us. And every mature tree gives out enough oxygen to keep two adult humans alive. Can't say better than that. We really, really need our green spaces. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much to uh, all the people who put together that uh, video. I hope you really, really enjoyed it. Um, I found it um, really inspiring. I found it really um, interesting as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's fantastic. I'm really pleased to be showing that to, to you all today. Um, so next up we have uh, David Linder. We're, we're very pleased to be joined by the Urban Birder, who is going to be explaining why he's passionate about birding and nature and also give us some tips on uh, what we can do on our own gardens and outdoor spaces to help birds and the environment. So David, over to you. Okay, can you hear me? Good. Well, Andrew, thank you very much for, for the introduction and uh, it's been a very interesting uh, conference listening to what people have been saying today. And it resonates. Oh, David, you've gone on to mute. <laughs> Tell you, this is so sensitive to stuff. I better keep my hands up here so you can see them. <laughs> um, but basically, it's been great to uh, to be part of this. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I must say that my um, experience of Wandsworth is not one as a as a resident and by the way please excuse my lockdown uh, headphones they happened to break yesterday and that was too late to, to do anything about it um no I'm not an actual uh, resident of Wandsworth however I do know the area very well and I've actually raised my binoculars um in the direction of birds in the borough for example Battersea Park I've been there during the autumn um, uh, it's a good spot actually because lots of migrating birds passing through from Northern uh, Europe and Scandinavia, passing through London and Battersea and Wandsworth, uh, heading to their destinations in, in Africa, which I find amazing. I, I just find the whole idea that we are visited by all these different creatures from all over the world sometimes, right here in London. And that's the thing that people sometimes don't think about they just you know when i talk to people about birds and wildlife in london and when i take people on, on walks around the streets of london they expect to see pigeons and and sparrows and by the way there's nothing wrong with those two birds even the pigeon i actually have become i wouldn't say lover but certainly a liker of pigeons because they are so graceful and uh, not just when they're being chased by peregrines either um but it's interesting because people feel that there's not much to be seen, uh, but there is such a wealth of wildlife to be noticed. And in London, for example, the number of species of birds to be seen or have been seen over the period of, well, since records began, which is probably in the late 1800s, numbers around about 356 species. That is a lot of birds. And when you think that the national total is 620, it just shows you how rich London is. And 
looking at what's happening in Wandsworth and what's going to be happening in the future, you know, it is a bright future. And I think it's, you know, if I lived in Wandsworth, and I'm sure the people that do live in Wandsworth hopefully will have the pride um, to sort of be out there and know, knowing that they're actually contributing to the conservation of nature as well as observing it, which is the, the, the fun part, I suppose. Um, yeah, and also I used to know the Wandle quite well as well, so that's another area. But I actually, um, I'm from northwest London. I'm from, uh, well, raised in Park, well, born in Park Royal, but raised in Wembley. And my interest in nature was innate. I was born with this, this interest which came from nowhere. And I remember, um, you know, as a kid, being surrounded by people, including my family, that had no interest whatsoever. Um, so I taught myself. And it started off with looking at my back window as a tender five-year-old, seeing these, well, actually, let me go wind back a bit before then. It started off with actual, with actually insects and invertebrates, because when I was in primary school, I noticed in uh, school wood that there was lots of, of activity of that nature. And I actually brought back seeds and planted them in my garden. So I thought, I want to have a bit of my school in my garden. And I formed an area which was quite wild, inadvertently attracting in lots of invertebrates and butterflies. And when I noticed them, I suddenly realised that there were birds there as well. In fact, my switch from insects to birds was when I found some cuckoo spits. And I'm sure you, you know what cuckoo spit is, but it's basically the larvae stage of frog hoppers and they surround themselves with this foam. And I remember, you know, learning about cuckoo spit, coming back to my garden and seeing cuckoo spit and thinking, oh my God, a cuckoo's been in my garden and it's been, and it's been spitting. Um, but then I realised obviously it was an insect, but then that brought me onto the birds. And as a kid, you know, I saw sparrows and I saw starlings and blackbirds, but I didn't know what they were. I had no one to tell me. So um, I, I named them as I saw them. So sparrows were baby birds, starlings, mummy birds, blackbirds, daddy birds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but as a kid, I kind of taught myself about the value of biodiversity because I realised uh, unconsciously that if you have a garden and if you kind of try and encourage wildlife to come to your garden, then it will. And it doesn't matter how bleak you may think your garden is. I mean, I remember being in my mate's garden in Notting Hill and I lived in his house actually for a few years and his garden was effectively a concrete patio with not a lick of green anywhere. And plus it was walled in by the houses that were in, you know, behind his back garden. So it's completely walled in, but yet I managed during that period of time that I was there, which is a few years, I managed to see about 55 different species of bird in or over his garden, the last of which was some swans flying over. Because even though mute swans are apparently supposed to be quiet, when they fly and they make a whoosh, whoosh, whoosh noise with their wings, so I heard that, I knew that it was a mute swan flying over. But the classic thing I saw, I remember one cup final day, coming down to his patio, looking out the window, and it was May, and I remember looking out the window and we had these little sort of plastic um or well, yeah plastic goals because we as two men two boys actually we like playing football in that garden and standing on top of one of the goalposts was a species called the wheat ear which for those who don't know a wheat ear is a small uh bird that migrates from here and even as far as uh, greenland all the way to africa and they nest in really wild, remote places. And to see one on a concrete, in a concrete garden, patio garden, on top of a goalpost was like, but it just shows you that anything can turn up anywhere at any time. And I think it kind of gives us hope that no matter what you do, no matter how small you think it might be, it can really be a massive help to nature and biodiversity. So. What I'm trying to say is, I mean, given that we've had many really interesting talks today about the greater world within Richmond and Wandsworth in terms of the green areas, and it's also very important that we visit these green areas, and I'll get onto that um, shortly. But for me, conservation and understanding nature and helping nature actually starts from your doorstep. 
you know, if you even if you haven't got a garden, you can still contribute. You can still have window boxes on your window ledge that you cultivate plants in. But within that that little pot, there is a whole ecosystem going on. And that is actually part of the whole picture. That tiny thing is part of the whole picture. And to echo some of the, the words that um, some of the colleagues uh, today have spoken about, like Ian, for example, and Emma and Colin, um, talking about actually doing your small part. That's so important. If you have a garden, try and keep an area, just a little area, wild, you know. Weeds are great. They're fantastic because you will eventually be seeing, you know, once you're sitting outside your garden during the summer, you'll be seeing things that you never expected. You'll be seeing butterflies flitting out of your little tiny patch of green that you've got. You'll see if you if you rummage around, you'll find invertebrates that you never expected. If you wait and put some food out for birds, you'll be finding things turning up in your garden that you never expected. So it's all about believing that you will be able to actually see these things. And you will, because they are not that difficult to see, particularly birds. It's about getting, as far as I'm concerned, it's about getting onto nature's wavelength. And that can be achieved quite easily, I think, by being able to give yourself 10 minutes. Now, by that, let me explain a bit more. Basically, I talk all day long about urban birding. I love the idea of watching birds in urban areas because for two reasons. Firstly, I love the excitement of discovering something that you just didn't think would actually be there. I'll give an example. I was in the garden in Guildford uh, before lockdown and I remember standing in the garden and the person that owned the, the garden was asking me what birds they had about because I had no idea. So I said, right, let's go out in the garden and have a look. And we looked up and there was a buzzard straight away. And we saw a red kite and in her garden there were blue tits and robins. And within five minutes of being in the garden, a kingfisher flew straight overhead. She wasn't anywhere near a river. And that was amazing. But those sort of things probably happen much more often than people think. So it's all about realizing that you doesn't matter where you are in the city you can actually connect to it the other thing is if you haven't got a garden then pop out to one of those wonderful green spots green spaces uh, spaces and blue spaces in the borough sit down on a bench just spend 10 minutes blot out all the sounds around you just it's almost like meditation just blot out all that sound around you all the the human hubbub the cars honking horns people shouting after their dogs, you know, just blot it all out. And after a period of time, you'll begin to hear nature. You begin to hear birds calling. You begin to see things flying around you, which you may not have noticed before. And if it's a really lovely sunny day, lie on your back. Enjoy life for 10 minutes. Just lie on your back, look in the sky, and you'll see this amazing arena open up in front of you. It's like, you just never seen it before. I mean, as a kid, I used to look up all the time. I still do now, obviously, but I used to look up all the time and I used to see the clouds and I used to imagine them being, you know, massive creatures or spaceships and stuff. Do that. Do that. Have some fun. Because once you start doing that, you look up and then you start seeing that there's birds traversing the skies and you see that there is life all around us. And it's just an amazing thing. And once you actually get on onto nature's wavelength, once you actually start feeling and hearing things, it is really so good for you. You know, as there's been a lot said um, in the last few years about the benefits of seeing nature and the mental health benefits and well-being. For people like myself who've been watching birds and other wildlife all our lives, we've always known that. So I'm really happy, it's common knowledge, I'm really happy it's out there, I'm really happy that that secret has been revealed and everyone can actually get involved in it. Because you don't need to actually know what you're looking at, you don't need to actually know what you're listening to. It's all about the fact that you can actually hear it and see it. It's all about the fact that you've opened up your mind and your heart and your soul to the idea that nature's around us and it's so important because Lockdown has proven, proven this, you know, I've had so many people contact me during the first set of lockdown saying, you know, oh my God, I'm hearing things. 
I'm, I've, there's a bird in my garden, it's singing, you know, that's been there all the time. But the fact that they've actually picked it up is brilliant because now we can take that ball and run with it. And you'll find that by connecting to nature, you're going to be feeling so much better about life. And also it helps us through these difficult times anyway, because connecting to nature, especially from my point of view anyway, has really helped me um, try and sort of get over the whole upset of this, this situation. I spent lockdown in Spain. I'm actually in Spain now, but I spent lockdown in Spain and it was it was draconian compared to what happened in England. And I I think I would have lost it had I not connected to nature, had I not been, you know, already interested because, you know, the moment you, you get on your sun terrace and you think it's great, but in fact, in reality, you're looking at rooftops and, uh, you know, TV aerials. So you think to yourself, where is nature? But then if you just allow yourself to sit still, you look up and over a period of time, you start seeing birds drifting over and you feel as if part of your spirit is flying with them. You know, it's such a beautiful thing to connect to nature. And I think that Wandsworth and Richmond are great areas uh, indeed for, for that sort of thing. You've got lots of really beautiful green spaces to, to relax in and to enjoy nature. And I think that if you have a, a garden or an area you can go to that's local to you, use it. Just get there, use it and try and make it as wild and welcoming for nature as possible. And with that, I'll wish you a, a good seminar and thank you very much for allowing me to come and speak for a few minutes. Fantastic. Thank you very much, David. Um, that's a really, really inspiring talk. And um, yeah, it's, it's showing how uh, there's wildlife everywhere in London, um, even when you least expect it. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's definitely made me think about uh, what I'm doing with my very, very small garden and, and how I should leave some bits alone for uh, for bugs and birds and, and other things to, to, to explore that. And also, I love your talk about um, sitting back and, and, and seeing um, birds of prey, especially I, I do love it when I do spot something like a buzzard that's ho almost hovering in the air looking for something to eat. Um, and that's always very inspiring for me. Um, so um, that's that's what we've got from the speakers. But we are now going to do um, a live quiz. So um, on the screen shortly, um, you should be able to see um, a link. Oh, there's a link in the uh, in the um, announcements in the, the Q&A section. Um, so if you click through there, um, you will be able to go through to a website called Slido at slido.com. Uh, it's come up on the screen now. Fantastic. Um, so if you go through there, and you use the, the code that's on the screen, which is WCS2020, um, that you'll be able to go in and you'll be able to see the the um, the quiz and you'll be able to, to join that there. So we'll give you a, just a couple of moments to, to get onto that site and get that all um, set up and, and log in. We well, don't have to log in, just, just get onto to the question bits and then we can start the quiz. Um, so it should be fairly straightforward to to get onto. I have used Slido in in other um, sort of conferences that I've been to. It, it, it's very easy to use. Okay. So first question about trees and carbon dioxide. So the carbon footprint of the average Brit is around 10 tonnes of carbon dioxide per year. How much carbon dioxide will one broadleaf tree absorb during its full time life, um, uh, full lifetime, which is approximately 100 years? So is that one kilogram, one ton, or 100 tonnes? So the carbon footprint of the average Brit is around 10 tonnes of carbon dioxide per year. How much carbon dioxide will one broadleaf tree absorb during its full lifetime of approximately 100 years. So planting trees offset some carbon emissions, but trees also help provide wildlife habitat, increase biodiversity, reduce local air temperatures and absorb air pollution, which is all stuff that um, people have been talking about today. And uh, the amount of carbon dioxide a tree will store depends on many, many factors. So there's a type of tree, where it's planted, the amount of room it has to grow uh, and 
trees play a key role in the carbon cycle as they absorb CO2 from the atmosphere um, during photosynthesis. And so a broadleaf tree uh, is a tree that has flat leaves and produces seeds inside of fruits. And the other type of tree is a conifer, uh, which is a tree with needle-like or scale-like leaves, and they have seeds in woody cones. So once again, trees and carbon dioxide. The carbon footprint of the average Brit is around 10 tonnes of carbon dioxide per year. How much carbon dioxide will one broadleaf tree absorb during its full lifetime of approximately 100 years? So I think we've given lots of time for you to answer. So if we can reveal the answer. So lots and lots of people have gone for 100 tonnes. It is in fact only one tonne. It's just one tonne. So uh, yeah, um, the average British person needs to plant lots of trees to offset uh, your um, your carbon footprint. It's a, it's a lot more than, than people have thought. So yeah, there's something to bear in mind. So now we move on to flood defences. Um, so which of these are urban, uh, are sustainable urban drainage systems that help protect us against surface water flooding and help prevent pollution entering our rivers? So which ones are they? So permeable paving, rain garden or green roof? So which of these are sustainable urban drainage systems that help protect us against surface water flooding and help prevent pollution entering our rivers? Is it A, permeable paving, B, rain garden, C, green roof, or D, all of the above? I forgot to add that last option in there uh, when I first read that out, so apologies about that. Um, so as we've heard today, uh, our rivers are easily damaged by pollution such as sewage and chemicals and runoff from roads. And climate change means we're getting far more winter rain, bringing pollutants directly into rivers. And concrete, tarmac, astroturf means less rainwater is absorbed into the ground and more contaminated water flows into our rivers. So sustainable drainage systems, or SUDs, as they're sometimes called, are drainage solutions that provide an alternative to the direct channeling of surface water through networks of pipes and sewers to nearby watercourses. So once again, I'll ask the question just to make sure you've all, all got it. So uh, which of these are sustainable ur urban drainage systems that help protect us against surface water flooding and help prevent pollution entering our rivers? Is it A, permeable paving, B, rain garden, C, green roof, or D, all of the above? So if we can have the answers, let's see what people have gone for. All of the above is the most popular answer. Is that the right one? Yes, it is. Uh, all of those are sustainable urban drainage systems. So we'll go on to the next question now. So in Wandsworth, up to 6,500 kilograms of air pollution is removed by vegetation each year in just one square kilometre of land. But how much in healthcare costs is saved each year due to our local vegetation. So in Wandsworth, uh, and the, the answers there are either five million pounds a year, 500,000 pounds a year, or 5,000 pounds a year. So question again, question three. Uh, in Wandsworth, up to 6,500 kilograms of air pollution is removed by vegetation each year in just one square kilometre of land. But how much in healthcare costs is saved each year due to our local vegetation. Is it five million pounds a year, 500,000 pounds a year, or 5,000 pounds a year? So it's important to remember that uh, woodlands, plants, grasslands, and other vegetation not only remove CO2, but also air pollutants that damage health, human health. Trees in particular provide a wide range of services and account for most of the volume of air pollutants absorbed by natural vegetation in the UK. The most harmful of these are PM 2.5, which is fine particulate matter with a diameter of less than 2.5 micrometers or 3% of the diameter of a human hair, and also nitrogen dioxide, which comes from road transport, wood burning and industry. So uh, once again, the question in Wandsworth, up to 6,500 kilograms of air pollution is removed by vegetation each year in just one square kilometer of land. 
but how much in healthcare costs is saved each year due to our local vegetation? Is it £5 million a year, £500,000 a year, or £5,000 a year? I think we can go on to see what the answer is. It was quite split. What's the correct answer? Five million pounds a year. So this just shows how much of an impact trees can have on air pollution. Uh, in Wandsworth, the avoided health care costs resulting from pollution removed by trees was uh, estimated to be approximately 15 to 16 pounds per person in 2015. So on to question four. Um, are birds and climate change? So according to the British Trust for Ornithology, over a third of UK bird species are affected by climate change. But which species has been hit hardest by climate change in London? Is it the cuckoo, the house sparrow or the ring-necked parakeet? So according to the British Trust for Ornithology, over a third of UK bird species are affected by climate change. But which species has been hit hardest by climate change in London? Is it the cuckoo, the house sparrow, or the ring necked parakeet? I think this question shows, um, and so what we've seen throughout the session, is that climate change not only affects humans, it also affects our flora and fauna as well. I'm just trying to think whether David's talk might have given you the answer. I don't think so. Um, yeah, give you a few more moments to, to think about what the answer is there. Um, so once again, question, according to the British Trust for Ornithology, over a third of UK bird species are affected by climate change, but which species has been hit hardest by climate change in London? Is it the cuckoo, the house sparrow, or the ring necked parakeet? Okay, if we can go and see the answers. So most people are saying the house sparrow, what is the answer? It is indeed the house sparrow. Um, so yes, uh, apparently the uh, cuckoo numbers are in steep decline across almost half of England because of climate change, in, including in London. Um, but the ha bird that suffered most is the house sparrow, and it's been it's declined by an astonishing 71% over just 24 years. And the study suggests that avian malaria may be a cause. So the infection is transmitted by mosquitoes whose numbers are increasing because of our warmer, wetter weather caused by climate change. Um, the ringlet parakeet uh, is an invasive species better suited to adapting to climate change and it tops the table for the largest rise in London. So um, we are seeing declining numbers of house sparrows but increase in parakeets. Uh, so the final question in our short quiz um, and this is around um, green spaces. Um, so Wandsworth is the greenest inner London borough, but what proportion of our borough is green space? Is it 20%, 30% or 40%? So Wandsworth is the greenest inner London borough, but what proportion of our borough is green space? Is it 20%, 30% or 40%? So green infrastructure is just as important to the borough as its grey infrastructure of rail, roads, pipes and cables. And our green spaces are a network of parks, green spaces, gardens, woodlands, rivers and wetlands, as well as urban greening features such as street trees and green roofs. And these are planned, designed and managed to promote healthy living, cool the city and absorb storm water to lessen the impacts of climate change, filter pollutants to improve air and water quality, store carbon and improve ecological resilience. And I think today's session has covered all of that in, in far more detail and, and, and has given great examples of, of what's happening within the borough. So the question again, Wandsworth is the greenest inner London borough, but what proportion of our borough is green space? Is it 20%, 30% or 40%? So we'll find the answer now. So most people have gone for 40%. Is that the correct answer? Let's see. Yes, yes it is. So 40% of our borough is green space. This includes Tooton Common, which is the largest open public green space in Wandsworth, and Battersea Park Nature Area, which is the borough's local nature reserve. 
It also includes our front or back gardens, parklets, rain gardens as well. And that's more than any other inner London borough. But we do all need to work together to retain it and make the most of it. And that is the end of the quiz. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found it informative and fun. And um, I just want to say thank you very much to all of our presenters who joined us today for their inspiring and uh, fantastic talks. And thank you to all of you as well for joining us today and giving it the time. And just to let you know, uh, there's, this is the last sort of open session that we've got for um, for the, the council led uh, climate summit and um, we have a session later on this evening but unfortunately it's fully booked and that is going to be um, looking at what people can do to get involved. We hope that some of you that are here today are joining us um, at that session. There's also a few more sessions um, happening tomorrow. There's one around business, there's one around sustainable shopping as well and also looking at uh, carbon footprints as well. Um, so if you do want to go along and, and join those please do look on the Wandsworth website and you can sign up there. So just remains me to say thank you very much to everyone for joining and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you very much.